Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us so bright and early on our last day of ASAP to talk about ENT emergencies. My name is Teresa Wu, and I practice in Phoenix, Arizona, and I'm a professor at the University of Arizona College of Medicine, Phoenix. And I've had the distinct pleasure of working in clinical practice in county hospitals, community practice, rural sites, and in academia for the last 15 years. So much of what I'm going to talk to you guys about today is information that I've learned from really great mentors, educators, leaders, and also from audience members from previous presentations that I've given. So please take a moment to write down my Twitter account, and if you have any information that you want to share with the world, send it to me, and I'd be happy to pay it forward. So we have a quick 25 minutes this morning to talk about ENT emergencies. How many of you absolutely love ENT emergencies? <laughs> None of us do. I hated them when I was in fellowship. I was like, they're scary, they're bloody, they're wrought with complications, but I'm going to learn how to take care of ENT patients as if they're my favorite. And that way, I would never be scared to do something that I was uncomfortable with. So we're going to talk about tips and tricks that will help you kind of get through the day-to-day -day ENT emergencies that I anticipate you see in your practice. So here's a young child who has a foreign body embedded in her nose. And you've been tasked with getting that out and making sure that the parents are happy, the kid is happy, no one cries, and that you get really good patient satisfaction scores afterwards. Typically, we reach for some bayonets or forceps or some sort of object that's going to get in there to try to get behind the object and pull it out. What we found with trying to do that is it causes quite a bit of trauma and disruption, and it kind of scares the child quite a bit with some large object coming out their nares. How many of you guys have this at your shop? Yeah, the CATS retractor is great. You can stick it in there in that flexible tip behind the forebody, inflate the bulb, and then extract the bead or popcorn kernel or whatever it is out that way. It's a little bit more gentle. How many of you tried Dermabond or Octil? Yeah, take a little tip, a cotton tip, Q-tip, put a little bit of Octil adhesive or Dermabond glue at the tip of it, and just gently touch the foreign body. Hold it there for about 30 seconds. It will adhere to the foreign body, and you just pull it right out. We also use various suction devices that we can find in our department. The yank hours don't work quite as well because there's not a nice flange on the end to grab the foreign body. But this has now become one of my favorite ways to remove foreign bodies from kids' noses. How many of you have done this before? Yeah, it's so awesome, right? So this is called Mother's or Father's Kiss. And I just want you to pay attention to the awesome expressions <laughs> that the dad and his daughter have because she has stuck this little yellow bead up her nose and she knows she's going to have to get it out. So saving them a trip to the emergency department, he is going to give her a big father's kiss. He very gently grabs her chin, tells her to open up her mouth. He had, uh, closes, includes the contralateral nostril and just blows very quickly into her mouth, pops the foreign body right out of her nose. So you can teach patients how to do that, parents how to do that with their patients in the emergency department. Or if the parents are a little schemish or you're not quite sure if they're going to do it right, you can also use a bag valve mask and do the same thing with the child, either sedated or just gently restrained on the bed, and use just a little bit of pressure <laughs> to pop that foreign body out. Works like a charm every time. So who knows the name of the pseudonym given to the secret informant that spilled the beans in the Nixon Watergate scandal? Shout it out. Deep throat, all right, awesome. So let's talk a little bit about throats and sore throats, which we're gonna see quite a bit of over the next couple of months in our clinical practice. Patient comes in with dysphagia, odynophagia, fever. What is the diagnosis? Yeah, so it looks like this person has a large peritonsillar abscess. What you can see is that the peritonsillar space is full, erythematous. This probably started off as a peritonsillar cellulitis or a pharyngitis, and it spread along the soft palate and then evaded deeper around the tonsils. And as with any type of abscess in your body, it starts to wall off and become a phlegmon first, and then eventually your body tries to wall it off completely and turns it into a nice loculated abscess. So remember with these peritonsillar abscesses that they can extend as far back as your tonsillar pillars and down into your mediastinum and cause complications such as pericarditis and mediastinitis. So you want to make the diagnosis early and provide definitive treatment. Back in the day, most of us ordered CT scans to make this diagnosis, right? Because we wanted to know how big was the abscess, was it starting to conceal and become loculated? Are there different portions that you'd have to drain? Does it involve areas around the posterior pharynx, like the carotid artery, the internal jugular vein? And we wanted to determine the depth of that abscess. 
What's the problem with this, though? A lot of radiation, right? And then who are the people who are getting abscesses most of the time? Kids, right? So we were exposing adolescents to CT scans for something that we can diagnose clinically at the bedside with some of our tools we have available. So for those of you who know me from my other lectures and my life in EM, I love ultrasound. I actually brought one with me to the conference. I cuddled with her last night, <laughs> told her a bedtime story. But I do use ultrasound every day in my practice on all of my patients, and I feel it gives me some superhero powers. So this is very important. From here on out, that probe is not called your transvaginal probe. That is your intracavitary transducer. You will also, henceforth, refer to the transducer sheath, not as a condom. If your patients hear you saying those words as you're rolling in the machine to stick that probe in their mouth, your patient satisfaction scores are going to go way down. So we use our intracavitary transducer in our department much of the time to take a look to see, is there a peritonsillar abscess? How deep does it extend? And it is something that I can cut or aspirate in the ED, or do I need to call ENT? How many of you drain your own peritonsillar abscesses? The majority of us, yeah. We have a hard time fighting ENTs in Phoenix, so we do most of ours ourselves. If you give the probe to your patient and you say, hold this wand, especially if they're a child, this is wonderful, and you put some gel over the wand and then the transducer sheath over it and some sterile gel on top of that, give the probe to the child who has a sore throat and say, take a look at this, stick it in your mouth and touch it to where it hurts, they will touch the peritonsillar abscess. And then on the screen, voila, you have this beautiful view of an abscess and you can even see behind it where all of the vessels are that you want to avoid when you do your IND or your aspiration. So you can use color Doppler and apply a little flow to make sure that what you're seeing aren't other small pockets or just edema. And then you'll know that the meat of the abscess is seen here and it's anechoic black filled with pus and fluid. Here is a video of an ultrasound guided peritonsillar abscess drainage. You can see that this patient doesn't have a lot of trisma, so their mouth is able to open wide enough for the probe to be placed in in addition to the syringe. And as you're seeing on this video, one of my residents is going to pass the needle from this side of the screen through and try to aim for this peritonsillar abscess here. During the first pass, they go a little bit posterior to the abscess, so they redirect and they know they need to come closer to the surface of the probe anteriorly and then get a bunch of pus that extrudes from the abscess pocket. To keep your patients engaged in this process, oftentimes I will hand them a MAC-3 lingoscope blade and have them hold it in their mouth and pull down their tongue for me. It provides light into the back of the posterior pharynx, and then they have something to focus and concentrate on so they're not gagging as much and moving their head. If you can't find a MAC-3 blade that's clean in your apartment or there's just a few that are missing, we use lighted speculum exams for pelvic speculum exams and take the top off and sometimes we'll hand that to the patient to hold in their mouth. As you can imagine, you need to educate your staff about what you're doing before you walk into the room of the patient and have them your transvaginal probe and a speculum and tell them to stick it in their mouth. <laughs> when you're doing the actual aspiration, I wanna teach you guys a couple of tricks to help protect you and the patient from untoward effects and complications. And one of them is to limit your needle depth. So when you're performing the aspiration, you want to make sure that you only provide yourself with as much needle as you need to get to the abscess and also prevent the patient from if they get scared that you're sticking a needle into their mouth or they don't jerk forward and have the needle go too deep. So we will take a lumbar spinal needle, take the plastic cap off of it, and cut off about two centimeters at the distal tip, recap it, and now we only have two centimeters of needle available. And once I stick that into my patient's mouth, if he lunges forward, it's only going to go that far in before putting him at risk for vascular puncture. So here's a video of one that we drained recently in our department. And as you can see, he had a lot of exudative pharyngitis. There was a peritonsillar abscess seen on the left there on ultrasound. We've already injected a little bit of lidocaine to help anesthetize him. And now the resident is going in with an LP needle with the cap cut off just a little bit and aiming for zone two, which is just laterally to the uvula, and right in the middle where 90% of most peritonsillar abscesses will accumulate. And the aspiration really is as simple as draining a pimple. You just stick the needle in and pull a bunch of pus out. 
this patient ended up having, oh, looks like 15 cc's of purulent pus that comes out. It's a very satisfying procedure. Patients feel immediately better, and then in our shop, we give them a little decadron, antibiotics, gargle with some cold water, and just watch them for a little while to make sure that the abscess is draining and they're tolerating their secretions. There's some literature to suggest that instead of doing simple aspirations, we should be doing full incision and drainages of peritonsillar abscesses. So if you need to do this in your shop and your ENTs recommend that you perform full INDs, it's just as simple as subcutaneous abscess INDs, where you'll numb the area, make a small incision with a 10 or 11 blade, and they actually teach us to use a hemostat to go in and kind of dissect down to ensure that the pocket stays open so that the bacteria back continue to drain out and not seal this prematurely. Back on your tongue. There you go. Let's say your patient comes in with facial swelling, but instead of being internal, it's external like this. What is the worst case scenario this could be? Cancer. Right, Ludwig's angina or cancer, right? So Ludwig's is if they have a submandibular infection that's inflamed inside of the compartment underneath their tongue, and the infection usually comes from your teeth and drains down and pushes the tongue up and can be airway disaster. The disaster. Cancer, obviously, you want to think about as well with unilateral swelling, possible invasion into the lymph nodes, the carotid, the IJ. Many patients that come in with this, those are the two things they're worried about because they don't realize that it could also be something as benign as parotitis. So remember that you have three salivary glands in your mouth. One is on the middle inside of your cheek there. One's a little bit higher, and then you have your sublingual. And those can get inflamed either with viral infections, iatrogenically, secondary to medications, autoimmune disorder, and when it gets inflamed, it feels tender, it can get hot, it can have a bacterial superinfection, and patients will come in with submandibular swelling or facial edema. We are now using bedside ultrasound to take a look um, at the face for protitis, and this is with the high-frequency linear transducer, which allows you to see very superficial structures. We're just scanning along the area that looks red and inflamed. On the image on the left, you can see that there's inflammation and edema of the parotid gland. It almost looks like a cellulitis of the gland itself. And if you scan carefully through areas of the parotid gland, you may even find a stone or a hyperechoic calculus, as you see here on the right. And in those instances, depending on how deep the stone is, they may need to have the stone excised and milked out, or you can teach them to try to milk it out on their own. We have them suck on lemon drops or anything that's like a sialagogue to get the salivary glands working, and then we teach them to use their finger to massage the area to try to push the stone out. All right, question number two. Nine million terrorists in the world, and I have killed one with feet the size of, smaller than my sister. What movie was this from? Die Hard, right, the original. So Bruce Willis has really bad epistaxis here. And as you can see, many of our patients will come in with persistent epistaxis. I live in Phoenix where it's dry and it's hot and everything along the nasal septum is always eroded and there's lots of you know, cases of nosebleeds that come in through our department. So we've had to learn very quickly how to temporize the situation and get the patients to calm down. Because for them, this is scary, right? There's blood coming out. They think it's like you know, they're gonna hemorrhage to death. And most patients that come into your ED, how are they holding their nose? Right. They're like this, right? They think they're going to plug their nose, tilt their head backwards, and then they're cut, you know, coughing and sputtering, and there's all this blood coming out. So the first things first is that you teach your patient to clamp the nares and to go into a sniffing position where they're sniffing a rose so that if there's any blood that's not coagulating, it's not going down the back of their oropharynx. And then you ask them how long they've been bleeding. Usually if it's been, you know, a few minutes, that clot itself is still okay. But if it's been hours, they've been trying to stop the nosebleed, I usually have them forcefully blow their nose to clear out all that old clot, because it doesn't have as many good clotting factors as the new stuff that's bleeding out of their septum. And then I have them reapply pressure. Afrin or oxymetazolin and alpha agonist is a great spray, just a squirt up there with a little cotton ball to help vasoconstrict. You can also use lidocaine with epi. The epi will help to constrict the vessels in addition to providing some topical anesthesia as you're getting your packing supplies or whatever you need ready to stop the bleed. Oftentimes, patients who come with epistaxis are really hypertensive, either because they're nervous or their blood pressure is surging anyway, and part of their hypertensive urgency is causing epistaxis. So if they need blood pressure management, sometimes just a little bit of morphine is great to calm them down and to vasodilate and help you get through the next phase of the management. So we have nasal clamps in our department, and oftentimes we'll have the patient put this on their nose and then use their fingers on top of it to add a little bit of pressure. 
And then when their fingers are done holding the clamp and they're getting tired, I tell them to switch their fingers. And I teach them to resist the urge to stop and take a look and see if it's still bleeding because they're all going to want to do that to see if it stopped. If you work in rural practices or wilderness sites like I do quite a bit, we've had to be creative with our resources. And cute little chopsticks taped at the top can also be used to help temporize the bleeding if you can't find a way to apply pressure to the nares of a patient with epistaxis. If after afrin and after pressure they're still bleeding and you need to do something more definitive, silver nitrate works really well to cauterize any bleeding vessels. But what's the problem with silver nitrate? Yeah, it hurts, right? It's terrible. Your patients are like, this is the worst pain ever. It's like this deep, boring pain inside of their septum. So we do quite a bit of prep work to make sure that they're anesthetized and that they're experiencing a painless procedure as much as we can provide. So the first thing we'll do is to take some lidocaine. If you have 2% with epi, that's great. Right now, we're having a huge shortage of lido, so I'll take what I can get. Take it and take about four cc's of it and drip it into the reservoir of a nebulizer. Place it over the patient's nose and mouth and have them breathe in through their nose. It atomizes and nebulizes the lidocaine for transmucosal absorption in their nares before you do the procedure. Then you can apply anything else topical that you like, either if you have benzocaine spray, you have topical lidocaine gel, anything else that you can do to coat that area of their nares so that it is less painful when you're about to paint and perform your silver nitrate cauterization. I encourage all of you to buy a headlamp if you don't already have one and use one for your recreational activities, but I bring mine to work because I can never find the one from my ENT cart. And that way it'll allow you to have an extra set of hands free to do your procedures. In this cauterization video, you can see that they found a little bleeding vessel, and then the physician is going in with a silver nitrate stick and gently rolling it a few times on the vessel itself, but then also proximal to the vessel, where it's coming down and feeding into the area that's bleeding. Please resist the urge to paint the entire nares when you can't see the vessel, because that's really painful for patients, and it causes erosion and perforation through the septum sometimes if we paint too much. And definitely never paint both sides of a nares, the septum, because it will cause perforation to eat through to the other side. How many of you guys have to do nasal packing in your department? Yeah, I think it's difficult for our patients because you're coming at them with this large object and you're like, don't worry, it's not going to hurt a bit. I'm just going to shove it in your nose and stop the bleeding. So this is not the correct way to perform nasal packing, right? You don't want to aim up, which is the way it looks like your nostrils are heading towards your cribriform plate there. You actually want to insert whatever packing device you have and aim it towards the posterior occiput, directly through the tragus of the ear, and aim for the back of the head. Okay, and that'll go straight back in. It'll cover all the coana and the bleeding vessels along the septum and hopefully cause a little tamponade physiology on the vessels that are bleeding. We have various devices available in our department in our ENT cart. We have intranasal catheters, some were double balloon catheters, and these are really great if someone is coming in with what you suspect to be posterior epistaxis. If it's anterior and you can see it and you tried silver nitrate, something like a rhino rocket or some intranasal gauze will do just fine. But if you think that the bleeding is in the back, you can't see it with your speculum, you may need to drop a double balloon catheter. And the way to do it with these guys is you take it, I usually lube it up with either some baxitracin or um, some other antibacterial ointment, have the patient open their mouth and say ah, and then I will drop the catheter into the back of their nasopharynx and see the tip in the back of their oropharynx. That's how I know I've gone deep enough. Once I see that tip, I'll inflate that distal balloon, pull it anteriorly just a little bit to make sure it's taut, and then inflate the proximal balloon for tamponade physiology around the bleeding sites. If you can't find your intranasal catheter balloons, you might have to be creative. With big nosebleeds, we've used Foley catheters before, where we've had to drop that in quickly, inflate the balloon, pull it against the posterior pharynx, and get that bleed temporized before we can find our ENT cart or all of our other fancy tricks in our emergency department. Similar tips, if you have any tampons available, usually the OB ones work really well because they're the right size and they're small and there's no applicator. You just stick your finger on it and just pop it into their nose and you can keep that in there for a while. And some ENTs say, if it's stopping the bleeding, just leave it in, put them on antibiotics and send them to my office and I'll take a look in a few days. How many of you are using TXA? Revisaxis, it's wonderful, isn't it? How many of you are using the TXA tablets? 
So this is a trick for you guys. Since TXA is so expensive, you get these huge bottles that you only use a little bit of. If you can ask your pharmacist for TXA tablets, you can just dissolve in a little bit of saline and paint the area that's bleeding. It actually saves the patient and your hospital quite a bit of money and provides the same anticoagulation effects. All right, question number three. Where was the original Jaws filmed? Where is Amity Island? Yeah, so Amity Island is not real, right? They made up this place in Vin Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts to film um, Jaws, which just had an anniversary recently. And so now we're gonna talk about Jaws and dislocated Jaws. So TMJ dislocations I find are very fascinating and fun to reduce because it's satisfying when I can get a patient's jaw back in place. And just to review the anatomy of what happens with jaw dislocations, most of the time jaws are going to dislocate anteriorly, just like shoulders do and you're gonna have the mandibular condyle fall right out of that little fossa that it sits in. So they're just located anteriorly and inferiorly, and they can't open and close their jaw, and they can't move it laterally with any type of provocative movements. So your goal is to get that mandibular condyle back underneath the zygomatic arch and into that little space. So to do that, there's a couple different ways that we think are successful. First, you wanna put the patient in a position of comfort. Usually for them, it's either sitting upright or laying down, depending on which type of procedure you're gonna do. And then I want you to protect your thumbs with gauze. Sometimes we'll take a, a tongue depressor, break it in half, and put it on both sides of our thumbs, and then wrap it with gauze, because your thumbs are now gonna go inside the patient's mouth. So you don't want them to bite down on you accidentally and you know, make it hard for you to work the rest of your shift. So there are two or three different approaches that we try regularly. The first one is seen on the left on the patient here. The gentleman is sitting comfortably in the bed. We've wrapped our thumb. I'm putting both my left and right thumbs on his inferior molars, pushing down, extending my elbows, and distracting the jaw inferiorly. Okay, so that's pulling it underneath that little lip where the glenoid fossa is of the jaw. And then I'm slowly, gently rotating the posterior condyle back into that hole. It's a gentle maneuver and you'll feel a nice, satisfying click as it falls into place. If you can't get the leverage to stand above the patient and push it that way, you can also have them lying supine on the bed. You can stand behind them, put your thumbs on their inferior molars and push down for inferior distraction and then tilt and drop that in. Another method that works well is to stand behind the patient. If they're on a chair, reach around them put your thumbs on their inferior um, teeth and pull down on their jaw for distraction and then flip them back as well. So it's whatever's comfortable with you and what you can maneuver in your department with the number of chairs and beds available. So this is called the wrist pivot method and this has also been shown in the literature to work quite well. So go ahead and turn to your neighbor. <laughs> Say hi. <laughs> Put your hand on their face. No, you can, we, we've done this before, but please don't dislocate your neighbor's jaw because then I get really bad reviews next year for ASAP and they don't let me do this anymore. So you wanna put your fingers into the patient's jaw, put your thumb underneath their chin, and with your second, third, and fourth digits, you're actually pulling down and your thumbs are pushing up to try to pivot it on its axis so that you can glide it posteriorly into the fossa. Does that make sense biomechanically? Good. And then externally, if you don't want to put your fingers anywhere near anybody's jaw or teeth, you can also try this external manipulation where your fingers are going to be palpating anteriorly along the zygomatic arch of your patient. Second, third, and fourth digits are behind the jaw, and you're distracting in this situation with your second, third, and fourth digits towards you while your thumbs are pushing down and maneuvering that um, mandibular condyle back into the fossa. I encourage you guys to try this at your shop with a little bit of you know, Versed or Fentanyl or whatever you have to help calm down your patients. And if that doesn't work, you can always try the gag method. So oftentimes when patients come in with a dislocated jaw, we'll just go in the room, introduce ourselves, say, I'm so sorry that you're here, can I just take a look? Stick a tongue depressor in their mouth, gag them a little bit, they'll go, ooh, and their jaw pops back into place. It's fabulous. <laughs> Best dispo ever. And then there's a new syringe technique that just came out in the literature where you can take a 10cc syringe have the patient hold it inside of their mouth in a longitudinal horizontal fashion, and then teach them to gently roll the syringe back and forth. As they're rolling it, it's relaxing their masseter muscles, and eventually it just pops back into place. 
So after you've successfully reduced their jaw, they're really happy, they've high-fived you, they think you're the best doctor ever, just make sure you give them precautions where they should be following a soft or full liquid diet for the next week or so. And then I typically like to wrap their head gently and put them in a soft C-spine collar, not for any physical support, but really just to remind them not to laugh and joke around and open up their mouth too big for a while because they're at risk for another dislocation within the first 72 hours. All right, so my take-home points for you guys today is to be creative with ENT emergencies, attack those charts, grab those patients that you're scared to see, and definitely email me or text me if you have any tips to share for the future. Good luck with your ENT emergencies. <laughs> Thank you.